Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from our Top Secret Broadcasting Studio with another Watchman video broadcast. This is a continuation, part two, of a series that we started last week called Another Jesus, Another Spirit, and Another Gospel. We're going into a lot of details to try to explain to you the difference. And I really want you to pay attention uh, this week uh, to the things that the Bible is telling us because what, what, we're, what my goal is with all of this is to give the student of the Word of God, the believer of the Word of God, uh, the biblical counsel and the biblical teaching and discernment on how to understand the real Jesus from the fake Jesus, like in the Book of Mormon. See, they even got a little picture of Jesus in here. Nice brown, long hair. Um, this is not the same Jesus as the Jesus of this Bible. And I want to help with your discernment because I believe that it could very well be in our lifetime, maybe in a year, maybe five years, ten years, who knows? Maybe in your children's lifetime, and this is something you can pass down and instill in them, that we are going to be confronted with another Jesus. There are preachers right now who are preaching this other Jesus. Let me show you what I'm talking about. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 1 through 4 is our main source of study, and then we're branching out in Scripture from there. Paul says, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear less by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And Paul was very, I remember the first time really reading this. I pondered this. I meditated on this. No, I didn't go, mm -hmm, that's another spirit. We'll talk about that. Um, I thought on this verse. He didn't say another Buddha. He didn't say another Mohammed. He didn't say another Joe Smith. He said another Jesus. And so from the Bible, I think it's absolutely important. I think it's eternal life important that we understand who the real Jesus is as described by the scriptures and understand how to spot and recognize the, another Jesus. Jesus. He's going to be preached. He's going to be taught. And these, these are all packaged together. If you follow after another Jesus, you will receive another spirit and you will be following another gospel, which Paul said in Galatians is not another gospel. Even though that's what it's referred to, there, it's not another gospel. There is no other gospel other than the good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people for unto you is born this day in the city of David the Savior which is Christ the Lord Christ's death his his life his death his burial his resurrection his atonement for man's sins the free grace that God gives us as a result of that all of those are part and parcel of the real Jesus taught to us by the real spirit that leads us to the real gospel the gospel of everlasting life through grace and not works now, there's, there's an aspect of this that I want to start out teaching today. Um, I'm going to go back into last week's teaching a little bit and kind of combine some things together. Last week, we started looking at the types and the shadows given to us in the Scripture, uh, the, the duality in the Scripture. You have the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's the other Jesus. That's the Antichrist. You have the tree of, of life. And remember, Paul told us, he warned us, that as the serpent beguiled Eve, so that uh, our minds would be re corrupted from the simplicity in Christ. So we go back and we, look at, we looked at Genesis 3 and saw the corruption there, saw how the devil worked his work and what he was trying to get Eve into, eating from the wrong tree, the two trees standing right there. So we looked at that duality in the scriptures, and I brought up the idea of Galatians chapter 4, where Paul was teaching uh, about, um, about Isaac and Ishmael. And he said, this is a, the word allegory here, it doesn't mean that the story never really happened. 
it means that it has an allegorical uh, slant to it. In other words, it's a teaching type story that teaches us a moral lesson or gives us a doctrinal truth. This is the study of typology, and this is a lot of what we're looking at today because the typology of the scripture, along with the plain prophecies of the scripture, are where we get our wisdom and our inspiration from on understanding the real Jesus, being able to discern him from the fake Jesus. So let's go back to Galatians chapter 4. Let's look at how Paul revealed this to us and, and see in these two types of Ishmael and Isaac, see in these two types the difference between the real chosen of God, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and the one who was rejected of God, which is a picture of the Antichrist. Galatians 4.21, tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bond maid. Think about that. The other by a free woman. But he who was of the bond woman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants. And think about that now. The two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai which gendereth to bondage which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So he's, he's clearly teaching you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring my Bible over here. And I'm going to show you how God sees this and how God did this. All right? And w as I'm doing this, I want you to understand um, my, my belief, my life, my ministry, everything that I stand for comes from the whole of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation I believe it is the Word of God but we also know that there is a a right way to divide the scriptures rightly dividing the Word of Truth we don't have to divide it based upon what we think it's already divided Old Testament and New Testament and here's here's what God is teaching us now I believe both both of these work for our salvation. The law drives us or provokes us or puts us at the feet of Jesus at the cross because we realize and recognize that since we cannot keep all the law, that's very important, since we cannot keep all the law, this contract, this covenant with, that God made with Israel at Mount Sinai is void. There is only one who fulfilled every aspect of the law of God. That was Jesus Christ. He fulfilled it. He took on the law, and the Bible says in Colossians that he, that he, he took the handwriting of ordinances, God's own hand, nailing it to his cross. And so that shows then that the old covenant has been fulfilled, and now you and I are the recipients by way of Jesus Christ of the new covenant of grace. This is what Paul's getting at here in, uh, in Galatians. Uh, he's teaching you about the two covenants. He specifically says the two covenants. He said this covenant here is like Ishmael. And remember, Ishmael came first. He was born first. But he was born in old Jerusalem, or a, as born from Hagar, who represents old Jerusalem, the earthly city of Jerusalem. And it's in bondage. That's why God allowed this thing to happen between Abraham and Hagar. Because God knew it was going to teach the lesson and the story of the covenants. So those who, those who choose to try to qualify for God's salvation under the terms of the old covenant, they're in bondage. Because they're told that they have to perform everything that the law tells them to perform. But since nobody can do that, if anybody tells you they can, they're, they're lying through their teeth. That's breaking one of the laws. Uh, they can't do it. So now Isaac was born from a free woman, Sarah. So Isaac represents those of us who have been born, not of the earthly things, but of heavenly things. New Jerusalem, which is above, which is free, which is the mother of us all. So we look at the typology here. Isaac represents the, the freedom in Christ, the real gospel, 
the real spirit, the real Jesus. Ishmael represents the bondage Jesus. He represents the bondage leader who, if you go back and you decide to go back under the law, you're now in bondage along with Ishmael. That's how you're going to be born. And so the Bible is teaching us very clearly. And by the way, look at it like this. Uh, this was first, the Old Testament. This was second. Ishmael was born first, but it was bondage. Isaac, the second born, receives the blessing of Abraham and receives the covenant that God gave to him in Genesis chapter 12. Jesus said in John chapter 3, you must be born again. This flesh that I have with me right now, I hate it. I absolutely hate it. You know how you just wake up some days and you hate your hair, you hate your face, you hate your back, you just hate various parts. Of, the older you get, the more about you there is to hate. And I don't like my flesh. I don't like what it wants to do. I don't like the, I don't like the desires. I don't like the pride. I don't like anything to do with this flesh. It was born first. It's in bondage. This flesh is never going to be free from the bondage that it's under. That's why I had to be born again. And I'm saying all that for a reason. There is an aspect of the fake Jesus that goes along with the fake gospel. The real gospel says, since you cannot perform works to please God, and the truth of it is, not even what I'm doing right now satisfies the demands of a just God. It does not please God. It does not please His justice. Even though I'm trying to give you the Word of God. The only thing that pleased God was the bruising of His Son, Jesus Christ, Isaiah chapter 53. That's the only thing that pleases God. So if, if, if someone comes along now with a different gospel that says, oh, you've got to keep the law, You've got to do Sabbath worship. You have to do feasts. You have to do this. You have to do that in order, in, in order, to, in order to what? Please God? It doesn't work. It's another gospel, and they're giving you another Jesus. In fact, most of these guys don't even call him Jesus. He's Yahshua, Yahashua, Yeshua, Yahashua. I, I, I don't know how they pronounce it all. That's a different Jesus. It's not the same Jesus as the one of this New Testament. You see, the Hebrew Roots crowd don't even call this the New Testament. They can't stand that concept. They call it the Renewed Covenant. You know what they're saying? That only in, the, uh, only in these parts of the Bible here, God is just reiterating the fact that in order to be saved or stay saved or please God in salvation, you have to go back and keep the Old Testament law, the renewed covenant. That's not what it is. And so clearly there is a difference between the Jesus who came to die for our sins in our place, and since we cannot perform the works that God requires, only Jesus could, we believe and trust in His grace. The other Jesus... The one they speak about brings you back under the bondage of the law. That was the story of, of Isaac and Ishmael. Here's another one. Genesis 25, 23. The story of Jacob and Esau. Here again, we have two sons being born. In the first story, we had, we had Ishmael. He was the firstborn. 13 years later, Isaac comes along. Now we have inside of, 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 of Isaac's wife... We have two sons being born simultaneous. Now, there, there's two types of twins. There's identical twins, and then, I don't remember the word for it. There's twins that when they come out, you go, boy, they don't look like each other, but they're, they're born at the same time. Same womb and everything like that. That's who Jacob and Esau is, and you can clearly see the difference. Let's look in Genesis 25, 23. One of these sons is going to be blessed. The other son is going to be cursed and hated. And think about Christ, the blessed one, the Antichrist, another Jesus, the cursed one. Genesis 25, 23, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations, look at that word there, two nations are in thy womb, two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. The one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Look at that. He's telling you, look at the language here. Two nations, two manner of people, and they're going to be 
separated. That one does not go with the other. That's after, and I'll take look at this. Let's say that my flesh represents Ishmael. It represents Esau. You know what's going to happen one of these days? God's going to separate them. <laughs> I love that. He's going to take my soul and separate it from this old body and give it a new body. He's going to separate them. Through. They don't go together. They're not meant to be together for very long. God's going to separate them out. So look in Genesis 25, 25. Look at how God, look at how the Bible is describing Esau, and you'll see that he is a picture of another Jesus, the man of sin. Genesis 25, 25. And the first came out red all over like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. Esau and Edom, they kind of, they mean red is what they mean. And we're going to, we're going to look at that in a minute. But first of all, he came out like a hairy garment, um, like fur, like beast fur. And the Bible actually, you know, backs that up because when, um, when uh, uh, it, Jacob came in uh, to deceive his father, think, make, to make him think he was Esau, to get the blessing, he took animal fur and wrapped it around his skin, and his father's going, oh, it feels like Esau. So think of, think of, uh, think of Esau representing a beast, which is another Jesus, the man of sin, the son of perdition. And also he's red. <clears throat> and I want you to think about things in the Bible that are red. Uh, the Red Sea, uh, blood is red. And what else? Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Look at that. What is it that's red? The Bible says sin is, and, and I got to stop right here. I, I absolutely love this. First time I read this and, and God showed me the understanding of it, I just wept. I, I absolutely love this. When John saw, in the book of Revelation, when John turned and saw Jesus, after he had, after he had finished the work of the cross, and he, as the high priest, went to um, take his blood and sprinkle it before God as a remembrance of the atonement for man's sins. When John sees him now, I love this. When John sees Jesus, the, he said his hair was white like wool, white as snow. Think about in the Old Testament law when they took the sins of Israel and put them in their hands. They laid them upon the head of the sacrifice. And now, now that the sins have been atoned for, when John sees Jesus, his hair is white like wool, white as snow. Now the sins of mankind, though they were red like crimson, shall be white as snow. Though they're scarlet, they shall be as wool. I absolutely love that. That's the real Jesus. That's the real Savior. His hair. Now the sins have been atoned for, and mankind can be redeemed. But look at Esau. He is red. Edom, it means red. Esau, he is red. He is a picture of the body of flesh. He is a picture of the man of sin, the other Jesus. Now, hopefully then, when I read this next verse, it'll help make sense to you. Because God said, I hate Esau. I hate him. Malachi chapter 1, verse 2. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob. And I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. We all know this. The dragon is the devil. Revelation 13, it's the dragon who gives the beast the other Jesus, the Antichrist, his power and his seat and his great authority. So God takes all of those who are red in sin, red like Esau, and he takes their heritage and lays it waste for the dragons of the wilderness. It's a picture of the other Jesus in whom is no salvation. Genesis 38, 27 
And I want you to notice that we're, we're going to have another story now of two sons being born. Remember, we have Ishmael and Isaac. Old Testament, New Testament. Flesh, spirit. And they're separated one from another. Cast, the, the bondwoman and her son was cast out. So is Israel right now. And so, and then here, we, here again, we have Jacob and Esau. Esau was the firstborn. Jacob was the secondborn. But Esau and Jacob, they were separated. And Esau was cast out. Esau did not get the first right hand blessing that Esau, got, or the, excuse me, that Jacob got. Now we have two more sons. Look at this story. This is from the line of Judah. Now, Genesis 38, 27. It came to pass in the time of her travail. Think about the prophetic meaning of that, of that word, travail. That behold, twins were in her womb. And it came to pass when she travailed, that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a what? Scarlet thread, saying, this came out first. And it came to pass as he drew back his hand, that behold, his brother came out, and she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Perez, and afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was called Zara. Now, some very, very interesting things are going on here. Let's look at, number one, the two sons. We know that Jesus, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Mary, um, he came from the tribe of Judah. Judah had two sons, two surviving sons, and he has Zara and Perez. Perez is the line that Jesus comes from, the second born, showing you that this is where the blessing is. This is where the gospel is. This is where the tree of life is. This is where eternal life is. Through the lineage of, Zer of Perez, not Zerah. Because Zerah, he is the one who broke the matrix. Therefore, he is technically the firstborn. How did they designate him? Putting a red cord, scarlet. Though your sins be as scarlet. He now is identified with Number one, our flesh, which is sinful, always will be. Number two, he's recognized as and identified with the man of sin. Notice we have a travailing. Notice we have a birthing taking place. These are all pictures of both the coming of the Lord and the appearance of the Antichrist in the last days. So Zerah, he was born first. He has scarlet on him. He's red like crimson. So, and, and they're separated out. Let's go then look at, if you know this story, where did, wh who, who was the mother of these, two, of these two twin boys? It was Judah's daughter-in-law. She was married to another son, and they all died, and now she plays the harlot. This is the opposite of the virgin birth. Genesis 38, 24, and it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom, and Judah said, Bring her forth, and let her be burnt. And I won't get into the whole rest of the story here, but here's what's relevant, is that this other Jesus was born, the firstborn of this woman, and she was a harlot woman not a virgin birth. And so I want you to take this idea, this concept of, of birthing, this idea of the scarlet cord, Esau being red, pictures Ishmael being in bondage. These are all things that identify the other Jesus, the man of sin. We, here we, we have two sons. One is, one is the real one, one is the fake one. Remember when Israel made their choice, the day of, of Christ's crucifixion, they had the real Jesus. They had a thief and a murderer and a terrorist brought up out of the prison. Think about that. Jesus came down from heaven. Barabbas came up out of the prison. Somebody sent me an email and they noticed, because I had been talking about that, uh, that Jesus is the Son of God, Barabbas. And uh, some things are just real easy to identify in the scripture. Bar means son of, Abbas means his father. He is like a duplicate of Jesus, the son of his father father but he's not the real Jesus he represents 
sin. He, here Jesus was sinless. Here Barabbas, pff, there probably wasn't a commandment he didn't break. And God gave Israel a choice. They chose the man of sin, the son of perdition. You know what perdition is? It's the prison. It's hell. It's the pit. Barabbas literally came out of the womb of the prison, and that's who they chose. So watch this. <clears throat> Here's this idea. Jesus is the, the total sum of the righteousness of God. This other Jesus will be the total sum of the man of sin. Look in Daniel chapter 8, verse 23. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Notice 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now, I want to stop right here, and I want to clear something up, because there is... Now, don't you listen to this, because this is going to play into what I've been teaching here. Uh, the King James, and I pointed this out in a video that we did here a few months ago called Modern Bible Translations in the Spirit of Antichrist. The King James nails it in describing who the real Jesus is and who the fake one is. In all of the new translations, they do not call the Antichrist the man of sin. They take it and they retranslate it and they call him the man of lawlessness. You say, so what does that mean? What that means is, and this man is lawless. According to them, he is without law. The Hebrew roots people, those who would bring you back under the law, are try are use that translation because it matches their doctrine. And they say that any Jesus that you would follow that does not bring you under the Torah, the law, is not the real Jesus. He's the man of lawlessness. You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to turn you away from the real Jesus who fulfilled the law, and now we are saved without the works of the law. The New Testament's clear on that. Those who would preach another gospel, another gospel that says you've got to be under the law, claim that any Jesus who does not bring you back under the law is actually the man of lawlessness. And that's not what the Bible calls him. It calls him, I mean, compare this. Transgressors are come to the full. There is... The Bible talks about the dispensation of the fullness of times. When we see, we use this language because this is biblical. When we see a woman and she, has, she is in her ninth month, she is, we can tell by looking at her that she is full. She's come to the full. She is ripe and that child is ready to be born. This is what this is talking about in Daniel 8. When the transgressors are come to the full, there is going to be a peak of sin in this world. It's going to be just like, just like the figs. When they're fully ripe, you know it. There is going to come a time when transgression and the sins of this world are going to come to the full, and it's going to produce the fruit, just like in the Garden of Eden, the man of sin, the son of of perdition, not the man of lawlessness. Even the King James Bible will tell you he does. He's not without laws. He changes laws, but he's not without them. So look at this language now in James chapter one verse fifteen. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth. Notice the notice the words here, just like a child being conceived. Lust when it hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Bringeth forth sin when it is finished. Bringeth forth death. So here again we have, we have the two Jesuses. This Jesus, the real one, who was born, he said, I have come that you might have life. This other Jesus comes to bring second death. And think about those two pictures. There is a second birth. There is a second death. One Jesus brings you the second birth, the new birth, the real gospel. 
born of the Spirit. The other Jesus brings you the second death. Boy, the Bible's telling you. So here, here we have a Jesus that rather than destroying sin, and what the Bible says is the power of sin. What is, what is it that strengthens sin? 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is what? Esau, Ishmael, Zerah. The strength of sin is the law. So here we have, here we have two Jesuses. One Jesus will bring you into the new covenant, the new contract, the gospel of grace, not works. The other Jesus will bring you under the curse of the law. By telling you that you can please God only if you do these things. That's not how you please God because we can't do those things. Not the way the Bible, oh yeah, you can go for, you know, you can go for a day or two without lying to somebody or looking at your neighbor's wife, or any number of things that are in the law. You can, you can probably go a little while, but eventually you're going to. And for that, that's death right there. God doesn't exclude it just because a, a certain time has gone by. You're under condemnation now because you broke the law. The Bible's very, very clear on that. This is the difference between the two Jesuses. Now let's look at a different aspect of this. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, here's what the Bible says. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So here we have Jesus, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's the name that is given to him. In Revelation chapter 19, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Seven words. I, I love that. All right? King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, the Bible also identifies another one that has the same title. Daniel chapter 2, verse 37. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. Nebuchadnezzar, remember, he, this is in a direct reference to the image that he saw, the image of the man of sin, the idol that they built in, in Daniel chapter 3, who was 60 cubits wide and six, you know, 60 cubits tall, 6 cubits wide. If I got that backward, that would have been a funny looking idol. All right, But anyway, um, he refers to Nebuchadnezzar as part of that, of that idol, that, the head of gold. And he says, Thou, Nebuchadnezzar, art a king of kings, a replacement for the real king of kings. Ezekiel 26, 7, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings from the north, with horses and with chariots and with horsemen and companies and much people. Stop right here and think about this. And we've done teachings on all of this. Get the, uh, the, the video uh, called the, um, the Mystery of the UN or something like that, and I show you what, what is significant about the north. Horses and chariots and horsemen and companies and much people. That's Joel's army. You'll see that in Joel chapters 1 and 2. You'll see it in Revelation chapter 9. You'll see pictures of it all throughout the scriptures. These horses and these chariots are the army that comes up out of the pit in Revelation chapter 9 and they have a king over them. A king of kings. They have a king over them. The Antichrist is a king of kings. He is a, a ruler who has under him ten kings, and he is a king over these kings. But remember, Jesus comes from heaven. This one comes up out of the pit. So the Bible's identifying this, the typology of Nebuchadnezzar as being a replacement king. Now, think about this. Uh, here, and here it is, Revelation 9-11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of where? The bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Both of those, I mean, you can go look them up for yourself. It's very simple. 
Abaddon and Polyon means the destroyer. So here we have the opposite. Here we have a king of kings coming up out of the pit, and he comes and he brings what the Bible refers to in Ezekiel 19 as cruel authority. Mean, cruel, hateful authority. Self-seeking, self-honoring, self-pleasing authority. Whereas we have Jesus, who is the King of kings and Lord of lords, who the Bible calls wonderful. Counselor. The mighty God. The everlasting Father and the Prince of, not Abaddon, the Prince of Peace. The other Jesus will rule over people, but it will be in cruelty. It will be in harshness. It will be in bondage. It will be like the Israelites born under the Old Covenant. Because the Old Covenant was bondage and it was harsh and it was mean. And it said, and this, is, this is how cruel the Old Covenant is. It said, if you want to go to hell, all you have to do is look at your neighbor's wife one time and lust after her. That's cruel. How would you like it? And maybe some of you did. Maybe some of you grew up in a home where the father was so cruel and mean that even if you spilled just a drop of soup on the, on the table or on the floor, you received the harshest of all punishments. That's cruel. That's the other Jesus. He, he calls it a gospel. It's far from it. He says, come follow me. We're going to go back and do the stuff that's in the law because that's what pleases God. That's not the same Jesus. It's not the same spirit. It's not the same gospel. Cruel authority. Um, Nimrod was the first king on the earth. Now, I like this. I like the, the duality of the scriptures here. Um, and I was thinking about this this morning. In Genesis, you have the tempter coming to tempt mankind, and he succeeds. So mankind fails. You have now the New Covenant, the New Testament. The tempter shows up to deceive the man, Jesus Christ, and he fails. Mm -mm -mm. In the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, you have an earthly king, Nimrod, who rules over the world, and it is, is well known and well agreed that Nimrod, under Nimrod, was the origination after the flood of the mist, all the mystery cults and mystery doctrines of the world. He represent when you when you hear him talk about, uh, and we'll get into this. Uh, Bacchus, Dionysus, Apollo, all of these gods of old, they all originate, I think, with Nimrod. Nimrod, who was the mighty hunter before the Lord, and he was also a a builder of cities as well. We're going to look at that aspect here in a little bit. And so just think about that. Here we have, we have a cruel king in the Old Testament. Now in the New Testament we have the good king, the prince of peace. So beautiful. So be and, and here's the discernment. Here's the discernment that I want you to have in deciding who's going to be the real Jesus here. The Jesus of the New Covenant that rules and brings peace to mankind through his works, that's the real Jesus. Any other Jesus that tells you, no, you must perform this, you must do this, you have to do this, it's not the same one, and it's, he's going to be cruel. But he's a builder, just like Jesus is. Genesis chapter 10, verse 8, And Cush begat Nimrod, who is, there's that number, 13. It's the 13th from Adam. Stop right here. Uh, he's 13. Deuteronomy 13 speaks of uh, a false prophet and God sending one. Acts chapter 13. Hosea chapter 13. God said, because Ephraim is in sin, I will be unto them as a lion, a leopard, a bear, and a terrible beast. That's exactly what, how John described the beast of Revelation 13. A lion, a leopard, a bear, and the dragon gave his power seat and great authority. So here we have Nimrod, who is the 13th of Adam. Remember, Ishmael was 13 years old when Isaac was born. 
This, because that's when God gave the covenant of circumcision, and Isaac was circumcised eight days after he was born. Ishmael was circumcised at 13. Okay, So he's the 13th from Adam. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. I'll tell you what that means in a minute. Wherefore it is said, even as, Imrah, the might, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Now, I'm going to break some things down here in this verse. Number one, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Think of the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And that word before, what, does it mean he was a hunter and offering up his sweet sacrifices in the Lord? No, 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 no. Nimrod was, um, how can I put this? He was in the place of the Lord. Everything that Nimrod did, including his hunting skills, was done in God's face. In other words, he was bringing about his own glory and his own honor because of both what he could do and what he can build before the Lord. So we have a cruel king in the Old Testament. He comes first. We have the good king in the New Testament. He comes last. Also think about this. Uh, he is a mighty hunter. What was Esau? Get it? The red as crimson Esau was also a hunter, a destroyer. Think about that. And then we have, he is building things. Number one, Babel, Erech, Akkad, uh, Kalna, in the land of Shinar. It's now called Samaria, but that's what it was referred to as Shinar back in those days. And here's, here's the thing. Babel, we know what that is. That's where the tower was born, that was built, and, and, or partially built. <clears throat> and it was also what, what her name is, Revelation 17, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Thirteen words there, by the way. And Nimrod is a builder of the, of the world order, the old world order, and now he wants to build a new world order, not by doing something different, but by taking back up the rebuilding of what used to be. Now, I want you to think about this. Because the city... Now, let me read this in John chapter 14, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The Bible talks about a city whose builder and maker is God. Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. So Jesus is a builder. So is Nimrod. Jesus builds for us a heavenly, everlasting kingdom that will never have an end. Nimrod built Babel, and by the time one chapter later, God's already kicking everybody out of it. And the ruins of Babylon, of course, uh, Saddam Hussein started rebuilding that and so on. Uh, but anyway, that's the idea I want, I want to get across to you, is the idea that, number one, Babel, this king always brings about confusion. That's where the word Babel comes from. What does that sound like to you? We'll get into that when we talk about another spirit. A spirit of... It's exactly what it is. Anyway, the beginning of his kingdom. Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Four. Okay? Four cities. Principalities. That's what they represent. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness spiritual wickedness in high places. Nimrod is also a, a, a prototype of the ten-toed kingdom and the fourth beast that rises up uh, in Daniel chapter 7. That's what these four cities represent. So here we have Jesus, the real Jesus, who builds us a heavenly city. We have another Jesus which builds us an earthly city. The real Jesus will save the soul, that which, is, uh, that which is to be separated from the flesh. The other Jesus seeks to glorify the flesh and try to save the flesh. Now, I'll tell you, and we've, a lot of things we've talked about over the years deal exactly with this concept right here. The idea that Ray Kurzweil, 2045, man's going to become immortal, right? That's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You shall be as gods and you shall not surely die. That is what another Jesus represents. He represents, he represents giving life and more life 
to the flesh. And again, go back to the difference here. Here is the spirit. Here is the flesh. The Old Covenant, the Old Testament. The Old Testament only pertains to the flesh and the sin nature. It does not have any dealings with the spirit. And when God saves us, he saves us our soul, not our flesh. So another Jesus is interested and will bring interest in, number one, allowing the flesh to live forever. So let's, let's just break this down a little bit. Some of these faith healers, those running around, Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, everybody gets healing, everybody, Kenneth Hagen, uh, Joyce Myers, and the like, they all are pointing you to another Jesus, Joel Osteen. Think about what his book is called. Your best life, not then, even though that's what the Bible says. Your best life, now, you know what Joel Osteen's doing? He is building a Babel, an Erech, an Akkad, and a Kalna in this new land of Shinar. That's what he's doing. Because he's telling you that here on this earth, in this flesh, you can be rich, you can be healthy, you can live... Who knows? If you just speak the right words, which is witchcraft, if you just speak the right words, then you'll, you'll just keep fighting one disease after another. Nothing will ever kill you. They don't actually come right out and say it yet, but they're leading up to it. Some actually have. Some, some of these kooks actually have claimed that if you just live by faith and, and live um, and do all this stuff that they tell you to do, that you'll never die. That's a lie because they're trying to get you to believe that salvation is salvation of the flesh. That's Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna. That's the old king in the Old Testament. He's a city builder. He's a tower builder. The tower is a picture. We talked about this in previous videos. The tower is a picture of, the, of Christ. The Lord is my strong and mighty tower, high, my high tower. And then so in the... In the uh, plain of uh, Shinar, they were trying to build a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. God already has a city and a strong tower, Jesus, that comes from heaven down to the earth. You see the opposite here? Any preacher teaching you about success here on this earth and, and glorification here on this earth and and if you perform now, if you do things the right way, God will give you all these good things down here on this earth. Any preacher who's teaching you that as an abundance of his teaching is talking about another Jesus. He's not talking about the real Jesus. What was the example that the real Jesus taught us? Death. You've got to die first. Then you can have it. But Jesus did not and is not interested in... Um, dragging out or, or, or continuing the works of our flesh. He said it must be crucified, must be killed. That's where the faith of the new covenant comes in. Another Jesus will always take you back to works. He will always take you back to earthly things. You can have earthly money. You can have earthly power. You can have earthly kingdoms. The Antichrist builds earthly kingdoms. That's what he does. And remember, Nimrod... Um, there were three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham, his generation was cursed. That's where Nimrod came from. Let's look at it. Uh, Genesis chapter 10, verse 15. And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusite, uh, the Amorite, and the Gergesite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinai, uh, and the Arvidite, and the Zemorite, and the Hamathite, and... Um, Afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad, and the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma and Zeboam, and even unto Lacia. Stop right here. Canaan came from, and Canaan also is cursed. Canaan is also a 13th generation from a different, from a different relation, but they're all under the, the, um, uh, the line of Ham. Ham is the one who went in and saw his, uncovered his father's nakedness. And for that, his lineage was cursed. And it was the specific lineage of Canaan that was cursed. Remember, we're talking, when we say cursed, we're talking about two, two things that are opposite. Cursed 
and blessed. Um, this is curse, Book of Mormon. The Aquarian conspiracy, it represents the curse, whereas here the new covenant represents life. And so we have, we have Canaan, who is also the 13th generation from Adam. And I want you to notice that the cities that he built, Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma, Zibo, and Malaysia, these are Sodom and Gomorrah, that's the cities that God destroyed because of what? If you look in, um, oh, I just love this. I love how the numbers just work out and people can make fun of me all they want to. It just looks like they belong there. If I were to look in Genesis 13, 13, look at what it says. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Who built Sodom? The lineage of Canaan. So it's all, cur what did God do with Sodom? Destroyed it. What did God do with all the Canaanites? He destroyed them. He got them out. Canaan, the Canaanites and who were in the land represent the one-third of the, think about this. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem and Japheth are blessed. Ham is cursed and, and, and expelled. In heaven, you have the group of angels. The dragon takes how much of the angels? One third. The other two thirds are blessed. One third of the angels are cast down to the earth. And so think about Canaan and the Canaanites. God brings his people in and casts out the old inhabitants so that they can inhabit that land. And so it's a beautiful picture of what happens in Revelation 12 where one third, just like Ham, the third generation, one third is kicked out of heaven so that you and I can dwell in their place. It's an, and, so, and we're dealing with two nations, two types of people. One blessed, one cursed. One who is of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. One who is of another Jesus. And I, and I keep reiterating this. Because another Jesus will always bring you another gospel. And the way to recognize any other gospel is that it's going to bring a work in somehow, some way. Um, you must, you must uh, do penance. You must eat this wafer and drink this cup. You must speak in tongues. You must go back and keep feast. You must do this. You must do that in order to be saved. You, the, Paul was dealing in Galatians with those who were saying, you must keep the law to be saved. You must be circumcised to be saved. That was another gospel, and that's how Paul nailed it. They were following the wrong Jesus because their Jesus, Jesus was a Hebrew, so therefore he was calling us to be Hebrews. That's not true. That's a lie. Use discernment, people. Find these things out. Uh, so let's look at the Canaan kings. Since they're cursed, they're from that 13th generation. These Canaanite kings represent another Jesus. And this is where it gets really, really interesting. Let me pull... Um, Old Albert Pike out here. Okay, let's get Albert out here. Albert, you ready? Okay, on the front of Morals and Dogma is uh, an eagle, 33 stars here, and he's got a crown. That's a king. He's got two heads. And Albert says one represents uh, the male, one represents the female, one rep represents the heavenly, one represents the earthly, and they're joined together in one body. So take a look at this. Here's the Canaanite kings now, the cursed ones. Joshua 13.10, And all the cities of Sion, king of the Amorites, which reigned in Heshbon, under the border of the children of Ammon. And then in verse 12, we have the kingdom of Og in Bashan, who was of the remnant of the giants. So think about this for a minute. We learned in our study of the giants that both Sion and Og were giants. What were giants? Genesis 6. Here we now have a pseudo-gospel in Genesis 6, a false gospel. We have sons of God. We have the gods mating with human women and producing the giants. The spiritual world mixed in with the human world and these are now the kings over the land of Canaan. Very, very interesting. So the real Jesus, his literal father was God Almighty. His mother was a virgin. Here we have the, the giants who have the offspring of the gods, plural, and human women. Mystery of Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. 
Think about think about that. How how the devil mimics everything about Jesus. He's the opposite. And yet, whereas we have one God, now we have many gods who are mating with many human women and producing these giants. But here here's here's where it gets interesting. Okay. Um, Notice this, and let's look at it. In Genesis chapter 6, there were giants. That's who Og and Sion were in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men of old, which were of old, men of renown. So I want you to think about this, all right? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something, and I want you to really clue into what I'm teaching you here. This idea of the, of the gods mating with human women, and that's what the Bible calls them, by the way, gods, little g. The gods mating with human women and producing these giants. Now I want you to think about something, all right? And, we, and here we have the opposite. We have the Son of God. And then we have these giants who are sons of the gods. Now, I'm going to give you some discernment. I'm going to show you how to take this now and apply it to what's out there right now. Daniel chapter 3, verse 25. The King James Bible, look at it, correctly identifies the fourth in the fiery furnace as the Son of God. The NIV, a son of the gods. Who's that? You know who that is now. NIV, the New American Standard. The New American Standard is the most literal to the Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic. Well, baloney. The NIV, New American Standard, all these new Bibles. A son of the gods. Paul. And I want you to think about this. All of these modern translations now are pointing you to another Jesus. And Paul said, I want you to bear with me in my folly because if someone comes preaching another Jesus, you'll bear well with him. You find me a church. You find me a church that's still preaching. The fourth in the fiery furnace was the Son of God. Show me that church. And for every one church that still preaches the old King James, I'll show you a thousand that don't. The, all the modern Bibles now, and I want you to get this, since they are now, since they are teaching you about another Jesus from Daniel 3.25, that other Jesus has another spirit and another gospel attached to it. I am seeing in the churches that have followed all these false Bibles, I am seeing that they're constantly adding what you must perform in order to either be saved, stay saved, or merit God's blessing in your life. When the, when the pulpits are constantly coming out with seven, seven things, to, seven ways to have a, a good marriage, seven ways to have a great, and this is what they say, sex life, seven ways to achieve powerful success at work, they're telling you things that you must do in order to merit God's blessing in your life. That's Esau. That's Ishmael. That is the bondage of the Old Testament, and it's not the real Jesus. Whereas the New Covenant says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. The New Covenant says, Pray and ask God. He'll do for you, because you cannot do so, so what if, and I want you to think about it. Well, it's good, it's good lessons. What if there's somebody who hears this and they hear the seven things that they must do in order to have, a, let's say, a good marriage. And there's one thing in that list that they cannot do. What are they going to do? They can't do it. Here, Ed Young, Jr., gets up on the roof of his church in bed with his wife for 24 hours, news cameras all over the place, telling everybody that in order to have a, a good marriage, that they have to, them and their partner 
have to perform sexual rituals in seven different places in the house one day for seven days. What if they can't do that? You see, the real Jesus will tell you, you want a good marriage? Ask God to give you one. I know all about this. There are things that I love to do for my wife. There are things I cannot do. I ask God. God's blessed my marriage. Raising children. There are things that I know that I have to do raising them. But there's, in, in some ways, with each one of my children, there's things that I just cannot bring myself to do. I've failed my children. But I've asked God to bless them. You see where I'm getting at? Anytime there's, a, and that's, this is the new gospel now that's coming out. It's not about, do you believe and will you ask God? Rick Warren himself, Rick Warren himself in the Purpose Driven Church book says, it is a fallacy for pastors to think that prayer alone will build a healthy church. That's a different gospel than the, this gospel right here. Whereas Jesus said on this rock, I will build my church. Different Jesus, different Bible, different gospel, and a different spirit. It's everywhere, people. And your neighbors and your family members are all falling for it. Don't go their way. You stand. Let's bring out another aspect of this. We mentioned uh, the Canaan kings in Joshua 13. We have, these are the ones that they killed on the other side of Jordan. These are the ones that Moses killed. Moses killed Og and he killed Sion. So that's two. They cross over Jordan. Joshua goes in and kills Joshua chapter 12, verse 24, the king of Tirzah, one and all the kings, 30 and one. I'll give you about five seconds to do the math. 31 plus two. Two plus one is three. Bring the three down. 33. Who was 33? Jesus, when he died on the cross, and think about it. It's so beautiful. Think about it. Here, here, Moses represents the Old Testament. Joshua represents the New Testament. And by the way, by the way, Moses could not lead the people into the promised land. The Old Testament cannot take you to heaven. That's why Moses had to die. So Joshua, Jesus, could take his place. By the way, Joshua, in the New Testament, the King James Bible, guess what he's called? Jesus the right translation okay so anyway so here it is the two the two the old testament new testament together they kill 33 kings here is jesus who comes the first time he's coming again he represents the coming of the first covenant the coming of the second covenant and he dies and he kills all of his enemies against whom he fights and one of those enemies, here he is right here, right on the front of Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma. Here is the enemy that he kills. Put that graphic up on the screen. The beast, who is the son of, a son of the gods and of human women. He's a king, and his number is 33. And that, just think about it. It's another Jesus. And by the way, Christ, when he died... He came to destroy this other king. And I'll say this too. Those who are of the old covenant do not like, they hate those who are of the new covenant. That's why Hebrew Roots and Septa Adventists and all these other people who are bringing you under the word. That's why any, any group who says you must perform works in order to be saved, stay saved, whatever it is, they hate those who preach the gospel of free grace. They hate us. Absolutely hate us. Christ came to destroy those works, that preaching, that gospel, that Jesus, and that spirit. Came to destroy it because he knows that it ultimately is going to bring about the fruit, the man of sin, the son of perdition. So we have the 33. Here's another story, and I've brought this out s several times. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 1. Ben Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his host. Host is, think about like angelic words. All his host together, and there were 30 and 2 kings with him. Stop right here. Let's do the math again. We have 1 plus 
32, 2 plus 1 is 3, bring the 3, it's the same number. Think about it. Think about the story and the types that God has seen. By the way, go study 1 Kings 20, verse 1. I don't have time to get into it today. Beautiful, beautiful story. Because Ben hated and the kings, the 32 kings, the 33, they come against the king of, of um, who would this be? Uh, Samaria. They come against the king of Israel. The first time they fight is on top of a hill and they lose. They regroup and they come back again. The second time they fight is down in a valley and they lose again. The first time Jesus fought his enemies was up on the hill, Golgotha. The second time he fights them is going to be in the valley of Armageddon. And they're still not going to win. <laughs> I love it. I love that. Listen, I, listen. I, I love this Bible, and if you don't like it, I can't help it. All right? Let me show you another illustration of the... The, of this 33 concept, all right? Uh, take a look at this graphic right here. This is uh, the what's called the Sephiroth, or the Tree of Life. Now, I want to stop right here, okay? The Tree of Life. It's not really the Tree of Life. That's a lie. Remember, it's another Tree of Life. And another Tree of Life is not really another Tree of Life. It's the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil. So even the terminology that's being used. If just because you go in the church and they say Jesus or Yeshua, that doesn't mean they're talking about the same one. Just because they say, oh, you need to get full of the Spirit, that doesn't mean it's the same one. Just because they have a dove coming down, don't be fooled by that. Oh, you need to hear the gospel. I'm going to preach the gospel to you. I'd listen to it very carefully. And if it says that you've got to perform works in order to get it, it's not the same gospel. So here it is. The Jews, this is, this is the core of practically all Judaism today. And it's been around for thousands of years. When Paul, when, and this is essentially witchcraft. When Paul nailed these guys in the book of Galatians, he said, Oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? He, he was using the exact right words here. Because he knew and the Holy Spirit was giving him utterance that at the core of the Judaizers who had gone into that church in Galatia was the Kabbalah witchcraft that, that they practiced. They believed that hidden inside the Old Covenant, the law, the Torah, was secret instructions that Moses had, that God gave him personally, that he didn't write down. He just wrote out the Torah as an allegory of how you can achieve eternal life. I submit to you, and I have the evidence, that the Hebrew Roots teachers are subtly, not overtly, subtly bringing its adherents under the, old te under the Torah because they're Jewish rabbis who are all Kabbalists that these men have trained under. Michael Rood trained under Jewish rabbis. Um, Peter Micus trained under Jewish rabbis. Jim Staley, let it slip in a teaching he did on the book of Romans when he referenced, we have divorced the white fire from the black fire. Jim got that from the Zohar, the Kabbalah. I want you to look at this. I want you to look at this image. I'm going to show you what white fire and black fire is. On one side of this, you have, uh, I want you to notice the circles on the left side here. One of them is called mercy. The other one's called severity. I want you to think about that. Right hand, left hand. They're opposites. The one side, no, notice above mercy, you have uh, Abba. And then above the other one, you have, uh, it's a female. I can't read it there, but it's Shekinah. <laughs> we'll talk about that one too. You have male and female, sons of God, daughters of men, opposites. Mercy and severity, they're opposites. White fire on the right side, black fire on the left side. That's where he got it from. He's teaching, he's bringing people under the witchcraft of the Kabbalah. It's another Jesus. It's another gospel. And it's another spirit. Okay? That's what the Kabbalah is. But anyway, let me, let me make this quick here. There are ten circles here. Think of, think of what? Ten commandments. Because the Kabbalah teaches that hidden, a secret, inside the Hebrew Torah is the secret 
to eternal life. That's precisely what the Hebrew roots people are telling everybody. You want eternal life? It's in the Torah. But anyway, ten circles here, ten kings, ten toes. The strength of sin is the law, the Bible says, and that's why there's ten. And so there's t ten circles here represent ten divine beings. But these paths that are going and intersecting each other, there's 22 of them. And again, do the math. 10 plus 22, 32. Okay? But then you have another part of this, another divine king in the center there making the form of a cross. That's 33 right there. That's what the Kabbalah is all about. It's about the reigning of the man of sin. And when you choose to follow the Hebrew Roots movement, they will eventually bring you under the curse and the bondage of the Torah because they've been told by their Jewish Kabbalah rabbis that the secret to eternal life is hidden inside the Torah. Wow. Here's another rendering of the... Um, the tree of life, excuse me, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it t it's sort of telling you right there who's in charge of it. See the serpent? That's him. Okay, now, take a look at this graphic here. This shows the idols that people always worship. Notice that it's the, by the way, it's the here, this one here on the left, is the fusion of human and animal together. We've talked about that I don't know how many times. That's Think of Revelation 13. Um, they're going to be given a mark on the right hand or forehead. And here's wisdom. Let, it, let him that hath understanding count the number for it is of the beast, for it is the number of a man. Notice beast and man are combined together here. Notice back here we have the image of a bull or a cow. And, and I want you to think about this because we're talking about the difference between the real Jesus and the fake one. Okay, the real Jesus will lead you into grace and everlasting life and belief. You, you can please God through faith. The other Jesus will lead you that you can please God and bring about God's blessings by the performance of something. So think about, think about all the differences here. All of these gods that were worshipped, they all had the image of, of a beast of some kind. Now think about the opposite here. Here we have what Pilate said of Jesus. He didn't say, behold the beast. He said, behold the man. To so the man, Christ Jesus. All right? Here we have in the Old Testament, we have all these pictures of the Israelites worshiping, not a man, but a beast. They worshiped. Uh, in, Revelation, in Revelation 17, you have a woman, Mystery Babylon, riding the beast. That's the image there that you see here. In this, this is um, the image of the European Union, a woman dressed in scarlet, riding a big old bull. The Israelites at the base of Mount Sinai. You see, here's the real secret of the Kabbalah, the real thing that the Jews follow at the base of Mount Sinai. You remember what happened? Moses came down the first time. What had they done? They worshipped a god. By the way, you go back and read this. They built a golden calf, a beast. And they said, let us have a feast unto the Lord. Capital L-O-R-D. Jehovah. Listen to me. They called their bull, their calf, Jehovah. Yod, hey, va, hey. Again, just because they say Jesus doesn't mean it's the real one. There's two of them. Just because they say gospel doesn't mean it's the right gospel. Just because they run around all the time saying Yahweh or Yod, hey, va, hey, or in their literature where they just put the letters, the tetragrammaton, Yod, hey, va, hey, that doesn't mean anything. Because the Jews themselves referred to the calf, the bull, the beast, as Yod, He, Ba, He. It's another one, different one. So I want you to think about this now. I want you to think about what Paul said in Hebrews chapter 10. He said, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats 
should take away sins. These are the replacements for Jesus. And it's not possible that their blood can take away sins. And that's, what's, that's what it is. When anybody gets you, tries to get you under the Torah, the Torah required as a sacrifice and atonement for sins, the blood of bulls and calves. And, and they say, well, that part was fulfilled by Christ. Listen, I want to tell you something. If Jesus didn't fulfill the whole law, he didn't fulfill any of it. You get what I'm saying? But anyway, let's move on. Now, um, speaking of what we were talking about, the, the Valley of Armageddon, where, where Jesus is going to come and conquer uh, his enemies again. Let's look at Zechariah chapter 12, verse 11. And that day there shall be a great mourning uh, in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadadrim in the Valley of Megiddo. Now, here's, here's something that I'm going I'm to start introducing to you. Okay, in the time we have left today, and then we'll try to, try to wrap this up next week. I'm going to try to keep this in three parts, but if God gives me more, I'm going to give it to you, okay? And we've looked at different aspects of, of this other Jesus and how he mocks or mimics. Here we have Christ giving his, the ultimate sacrifice, the Son of God. The, uh, he refers to himself as the Son of Man. He was called the Man, the Man Christ Jesus. His blood washes away sins. We have Old Testament sacrifice, the blood of bulls and goats, the blood of beasts, that cannot take away sins. But they tried, they thought that it was for the remission of sins, but it wasn't. It was a different gospel, another gospel. All right? So I want you to think about this. Um, here we have a character in the Old Testament by the name, by the name of Hadad Rimen uh, in the valley of, Meg of, Meg of Megiddon. Notice that they, it's the morning, and that day there shall be a great morning in Jerusalem as the morning of Hadadrimen. Here was, here's the deal. Hadadrimen, Hadad, and, and this is where, this is where I, I bring this in here. Ben Hadad, back here in 1 Kings chapter 20, the king of Syria. He is the son of Hadad. Hadad, Hadad. <laughs> Hi, Ben. Hey, Dad. Ben Hadad. <laughs> Got to have a little fun here. Ben Hadad was the son. He was called the son of Hadad. Hadad was a god. But he wasn't just any god. Hadad of the Syrians was a dying god. Now I want you to think about this. He is a god that died. And he was mourned over. That's what the mourning of Hadad Drimen in the valley of Megiddo. Armageddon. Megiddo. That's what that means. And that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of hated Drimen. That idea refers to them mourning over the God Hadad who died, who was slain in some way. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 9, look at this. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And that day shall there be a great mourning. This is the reference. Shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadadrimen in the valley of Megiddo. Now I want you to... I'm, I want you to get this. Look at this. Okay? These Israelites knew about mourning for the dying God. They knew all about it. And God is telling them that he's going to pour out a spirit of grace and supplications on Jerusalem. And they're going to look upon me whom they have pierced and shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. Guess who that was? It was Jesus. Jesus his only son, his firstborn, who they pierced, God says they're eventually going to mourn for him like they used to mourn for Hadad, the dying God. That's how they, they know all about mourning for the dying God. Now I'm going to give them the real son of God who's going to die for their sins, and I'm going to give them a spirit of grace and supplication. Whew, I love that. 
faith and prayer. That's what, that, that's what the whole New Testament's all about. Faith, I believe in God, and I'm going to ask God to do what I cannot do. I love it. Let's look at this example of a dying God, and we're going to see in here another Jesus. There is a, um, there's a video floating around um, called Zeitgeist or something like that. I've only watched part of it. I, could, I just couldn't take it anymore. I don't know what the rest of it's about. But I'm here watching this thing, and they're, they're, it looks to me like they're ridiculing Christianity because they're saying that all oh, this story of Jesus, that's that made-up stuff. That's, that's like every civilization in the world had their Jesus. Their God that died and rose again. Blah, blah, blah. This is nothing new. It was a different Jesus. It was a different dying God. Remember, the, the other Jesus is going to mimic the real Jesus in many, in fact, probably all aspects. He is going to be the exact opposite. And I'll show you what I mean by this. And the Jews, the Old Testament people, they knew all about this one because they did it. They did a lot of it. They had, they had mourned for Hadad. And remember, Ben Hadad was the son of a god, Hadad. Hadad was a dying god. And the Israelites were constantly mourning for him. In Ezekiel chapter 8, remember God's taking Ezekiel. And Ezekiel, I'm going to show you something. He shows him these abominations. Ezekiel's just shaking his head. Ezekiel, let me take you inside here. Let me show you. I'm going to show you something worse than that. Ezekiel sees it and just can't believe it. And he says... Then I'm, let me show you this. This is worse. And so by the time he gets to verse 14 of Ezekiel chapter 8, then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. Think about that. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Now, let's, let's bring this in perspective here. Tammuz and Hadad are all these mythological, actually it's real, the dying God. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you this one piece at a time, but what I'm getting to is, is that the Bible specifically says of Jesus that this man died once and for all. Then he rose again from the dead. And I, I never really caught on to this until I started doing the research, and I noticed that he's not referred to as the dead God. He's referred to as the dying God because he's the opposite. Jesus died once once. This God, this other Jesus, is constantly dying. Think about it. Because in the, in the mystery religion, when they weeped or wept for the dying God, whether it was Tammuz or Hadad or any of these other dying gods, it was done for a, a period of time. 40 days. So we have in the world today the exact same religion. They call it Jesus. It's not Jesus. They call it Lent. 40 days of renewal. And you put this little ash cross chromosome on your, you put a mark on your for, you put a mark on your forehead to worship this particular Jesus. Are you are you kidding me? Do we not have any discernment here? This is exactly what the Bible, this Bible is trying to warn us about. That's, it's time to tell you there's going to be another Jesus. You're going to have another gospel. That gospel, Roman Catholicism, the mystery cult of all the earth, okay, even bigger than Freemasonry, they perpetuate the myth of the story of the dying God and the days of Lent, 40 days of renewal. How about 40 days of purpose? Because that's where he got it from. He got it from the... And you don't believe that? Just go look up Rick Warren and see what he says about Lent. Did you know a lot of these Protestant churches now are following the Lent practices? And the Lent practices come specifically from the Old Testament mourners who mourn for Tammuz and Hadad. That's where it comes from. And so their Jesus would have you put a mark on your forehead. Mmm, I don't... I don't Here's what Manley Hall said about the dying God. Originally, he was described as being one of the guardians of the gates of the underworld. Think about that. He's the king that comes out of the pit. Like many other savior gods, he is referred to as a shepherd or the lord of the shepherd seat. Stop right here. 
We have the, the good shepherd Jesus. And in the book of Zechariah, we have the idle shepherd who's, oh, you're going to like this one. Unless, of course, you are one of the Hebrew Roots people, then you're going to hate me for saying this, okay? The Bible says blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. I'm going to show you this. Because Zechariah calls the Antichrist, the other Jesus, the idol shepherd. See, he's the opposite. He's an idol, I-D-O-L, which means he is like this. He doesn't move. He's got ears, can't hear, eyes, can't see. He's got legs. They have to carry him around everywhere. Do you notice that? He's got arms. He can't embrace you. He can't save you. So he's an idol shepherd. He's the other Jesus, all right? And this idol shepherd is blind in his right eye. God put out his right eye. So you see all these rock stars doing this, or they're doing this, all right? They're What's on the back of the $1 bill is the one-eyed God. That's who he is. Odin, I think, was the one-eyed God. And here's, why, here's what God did. God put out, God blinded him in his right eye. He darkened his right eye. Now I want you to look at this. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Here's my left eye. It can see the left side of my Bible, which is the Old Covenant. When you're blinded in the right eye, you cannot see the Jesus of the New Testament. You ponder that. You think about that for a long time. By the way, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Which way does Hebrew go? That way. New Testament written in Greek. Which? You see, now the Hebrew Ruth people want to bring you in and say, oh no, it, the, the New Testament originally was written in Hebrew. It would have been written in Hebrew. They're want, they keep pointing you this way into your Bible. Let's move on. So he's the shepherd, the Lord of the shepherd seat. Tammuz occupies a remarkable position of son and husband of Ishtar. That's the Babylonian, that's Mystery Babylon, and Assyrian mother goddess. Ishtar, to whom the planet Venus was sacred, was the most widely venerated deity of the Babylonian and Assyrian pantheon. She was probably identical with Ashtaroth, Ashtarte, Aphrodite. I would throw in here Isis, uh, Diana, whom the Bible says the whole world worshipeth. Uh, the story of her descent into the underworld in, in search presumably for the sacred elixir which alone could restore Tammuz to life is the key to the ritual of her mysteries. Tammuz, whose annual festival, that's Lent, took place just before the summer solstice, died in midsummer in the ancient month, um, which bore his name and was mourned with elaborate ceremonies. The manner of his death is unknown, but some of the accusations made against Ishtar by Isdubar, which is Nimrod, would indicate that she, indirectly at least, had contributed to his demise. The resurrection of Tammuz was the occasion of great rejoicing, at which time he was hailed as a redeemer of his people. Now think about that for a minute. Think about... What, the, what, what's, what this whole other Jesus concept is all about. It's a mimicry and a mockery of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ who died and rose again on the third day. Now, uh, and, that's what, and that's what Lent is all about. That's what the 40 days of purpose is all about. It's about mourning the dying God and rejoicing at his Resurrection. Now, I want you to, uh, we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of, of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Now, I want to show you this, because if we look back at this graphic here of this X in ashes on this gal's forehead, that looks an awful lot like the X chromosome. And I want you to think about this and put this together with what I said. Uh, let me pull this out here, okay? We're gonna show, I'm going to show you something here in a little bit, all right? Your chromosomes, we've talked about this, is where your DNA is stored, your two-stranded DNA. And this, this X chromosome rep and, and is in the flesh. It's the DNA of the flesh, and it represents what must die. And Paul said that he bears about in his body 
the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here we have the X chromosome looking like a cross, and it's got the entwined serpent DNA in it. That's because it came from the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3, and the deceit of the serpent. And so the, the real Jesus, Paul was talking about the real Jesus, how he died. We have that dying, uh, that dead Jesus in us, representing the crucifixion of our flesh and the death of our flesh. So that when our flesh is gone, our spirit, our soul and spirit can be set free and live forever. The other Jesus always wants to try to preserve this flesh. How are they going to do it? Got to add something to it. So here in the uh, trichetra, no, I didn't say trifecta, all right? And the <laughs> some of you horse people will know that. The trichetra here, this represents the two strands of man's DNA. Something has to be added to it in order for man to become a god. Let me show it to you this way. Here is the two strands of your DNA. Here is what's added to it. Another testament of Jesus Christ, it's added to it. It's another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. Let me show you then this. Another testament of Jesus Christ. Same symbol, same concept, same idea. By the way, this Bible will not reveal to you what hell really is. It hides it under names that you've never heard of, like Gehenna and Hades and Sheol. Those are the Hebrew and Greek words for those things, okay? I've never, I've never gone up to somebody and asked them, uh, do you know that without Jesus you'll die and go to Sheol? They don't know what that means. If I said, you know, if you, if you live without Jesus, you'll die and go to hell, they know exactly what that is, all right? So anyway, that X represents... On, on, the, um, on, the, on the forehead here of the dying God represents the resurrection of this dying God in your flesh. And that's what this is all about. That's the other gospel and the other Jesus that all this is referring to. We talked about Tammuz. We talked about Hadad. Um, here we have Adonis. This is all myth here. These are the stories now that have been creeping around. And actually, they, are, they represent the dying God, which is the Antichrist. And I'll explain myself. Uh, we'll look at it a little bit. I'm almost out of time today. But we'll look at it uh, a little bit further next week and understand this concept of the dying God and how it fits in with Bible prophecy and, and how, how I think, just a little theory here, how I think the dying God who keeps on dying is resurrected. By the way, I say keeps on dying. The Roman Catholic Church walks around with an X chromosome, a cross. What do they have on there? A dead Jesus. Still dead. Still dying. So I don't understand that. Roman Catholic doctrine teaches that every time they perform the Mass. It's actually called the ceremony of the sacrifice of the Mass. Every time a Catholic priest performs a Mass, they kill Jesus all over again. And let's say that, let's just say in America, and Catholic churches all around the country performing Masses every day, in monasteries, convents, you name it. Maybe into the thousands of times each day. Worldwide, who knows? Who knows how many Roman Catholic churches there are, how many mass rituals they performed. Every wedding, every death, every funeral, every church service, every, every time someone wants to get out of purgatory, everything. They have the dying Jesus dying all over again. He is perpetually dying. That's another Jesus. It's not the same Jesus. I want you to think of humanity too. Always dying. Always dying. Read Genesis 5. Adam lived 930 years and he died. Seth, his son after him, lived I don't know how many years and he died. And then his son, he died. And then his son, he died. There's a perpetual dying going on because 
this God is inside of us. I kind of explained that before. I'll explain a little bit more later. But anyway, Adonis, he was a mighty hunter. He is a picture of the dying God. He is uh, a representative, Adonis and Dionysus, uh, two names for him. He is the vegetation God that dies each year and is resurrected every spring. Ho, ho, ho. Green giant, think about that now. I'm not saying that if you eat green giant peas and green beans that you're taking the mark of the beast. So don't write any letters to whoever owns green giant. Don't say that I'm trying to get you to get away from their product, all right? But where did they get that idea from, the green giant? It comes from what's called the green man, the vegetation god. The green man is all this concept. It's in the Rosalind Chapel uh, in Scotland. The green man represents the dying God who dies at wintertime every year and is resurrected again in spring. And then he dies again. Then he's resurrected. Then he dies again. He's resurrected. He dies again. He's, do you understand the cycle that's going on here? Every, and they called it the sun God. The sun God rose again from the dead, made it through life, and died again. Went to the underworld, rose again, died again, rose again, died again. You see the perpetuation here. The Catholic Mass, he dies again. He dies again. He dies again. Think of human beings now and the history of human beings from, from Adam all the way through. They keep dying and are born. And they keep dying and are born. Think about that as we move forward. Mithras. Ah, you're going to like this one. Mithras was the god who was slain and he dies, and he's resurrected. Actually, Mithras was killed by crucifixion, and he rose from the dead. So think about this. I want to. Those of you who know J R R R R R, how many R's he has in his name? J R R Tolkien. You know that his premier work, The Hobbit, and then The Lord of the Rings. I read The Hobbit. I read The Lord of the Rings. I learned a little bit about that. This was back when I was in high school. And I've since walked away from that. And I said, you know, I can't have anything to do with it. So it's, I, in my mind, I cannot, I cannot fathom the concept of why churches are using The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, to try to teach about God and Jesus. And let me explain something a little bit. J.R.R. Tolkien believed heavily in myth. He was a sort of mythological, he was a myth guy. He knew all the myths. He knew all the, the gods and the goddesses. When he wrote The Lord of the Rings, you can see in the names of places and people and different races in Middle Earth, you can see uh, the evidence or the remnants of the knowledge that J.R.R. Tolkien had of mythology. Um, Mithras, the dying god, you have Gandalf, but the elf name for Gandalf was not Gandalf, it was Mithrandir. That was J.R. Tolkien took the idea of Mithras and put it into Gandalf, a wizard and called him Mithrandir. Do you know what happens to Mithrandir in the lore of the Lord of the Rings? He's Gandalf the Grey. But then he gets into a battle and he is cast down into the underworld and dies. But he's resurrected again and now he's Gandalf the White. And so churches all over the country jumped on this concept because of the Lord of the Rings movie and said, ooh, that's a picture of Jesus. No, it was a picture of Mithras, the dying God who dies every year, resurrects every year, dies every day, resurrects every day. That's what he's a picture of. Here you have this book called A, a Hobbit, A Hobbit Devotional, Finding God in the Lord of the Rings. It's another Jesus that they're pointing you to, not the real Jesus. 
And so here we have, here's another picture. Here is, this is uh, Bacchus. He is the god of wine and fruit because he dies in the fall and he resurrects in the springtime and bears fruit. That's who Bacchus is. Um, a Bacchanalia is a sort of a festival where there's a lot of you name it going on. A lot of uh, bad things. Bacchus would be the man of sin because when these people, these pagans performed the Bacchanalia they were, I mean they were drinking, they were everything. He represents the man of sin. By the way Bacchus, if you look at this picture again he kind of looks like a little sissy boy, doesn't he? That's because Bacchus was, was determined that he was a god who was, he was hermaphroditic god, male and female. So, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wind it down right here, and I'm just going to leave you with this, and then we'll pick up on the idea of Bacchus and how he died, what happened to his body, and so on and so on and so on. We still have a lot to, we still have a lot to work on here. And I hope you don't get bored with this. But here's the idea that, uh, that Bacchus represents. Kenneth Copeland had this to say, and I've featured this in several videos, and, I, and you can actually look, at, look on those and get the quote. You can get it from the Internet. Kenneth Copeland is teaching everybody, and so are a lot of people, that God is both male and female. He's not not the real God. The real God is the Father. He is He. But He's never a she, never a woman. The God that I serve from this Bible does not have male and female parts. That's Bacchus. He is the hermaphroditic God. They call it, that, that name comes from Hermes, which was the God, Aphrodite, which is Ishtar, Ashtaroth, Easter, Esther, Isis, Xing Mu from China, um, um, Diana, Venus, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. So Bacchus in his representation is the fusion of the fusion of the two. This Hermes, the male god, Aphrodite, the, the pagan fertility ritual goddess. Okay, Think about that. Fused together in one body. That's the other Jesus. The hermaphroditic God who is both male and female. How many people worldwide follow guys like Kenneth Copeland and these others who are teaching that their God is a hermaphrodite God. And I want you to think about the, the, what, you, what you are accepting now. Because if you, let's say, you go, to, you go to Walmart, you go to the mall, you go to the marketplace, and we, we invariably see these people running around. We see men, or we see a woman's figure, and upon close inspection, you don't have to get too close, you find out, boy, that woman's awfully tall, awfully strong built, those legs, <gasps> that's not a woman, that's a man. It just sickens our stomach to see a man walking around with the attire of a woman. God actually calls it an abomination. Or we see these women, and you can spot them a mile away, short hair, male clothes, jeans, tough looking, deep voice, their arm around some other weak-minded girl. Yeah, yeah, I know who that is. Okay, it's an abomination. So to think that your Savior, your God, is like one of them. Paul said they're going to bring you another Jesus, and they'll well bear with the preachers who bring in another Jesus. Think of the millions of people worldwide who follow that doctrine. Whew. Along with that doctrine comes another spirit 
and the word faith, gospel, which means if we produce certain things and we perform things, then God will release his blessings on us. It's a lie. I'm telling you it's a lie. We're going to get into a lot more things here. Uh, I, I don't want to bore you with this, but I do want to cover all the ground that we can so that we understand the difference between the real Jesus and the fake Jesus. And then we'll use that as a springboard. Hopefully it won't take us too long to deal with another spirit and another gospel. And I'm laying, I'm spending so much time now because I'm laying that framework and that foundation. All right? So bear with me a little, please, in my folly. Because I, like Paul, am jealous over you with a, with a godly jealousy. Because I think that if, you, if you're one of those that comes to Jesus and you want His grace and His salvation in your life, I'm going to help you to overcome the wolves who would come after you to try to bring you another Jesus. I want to help give you discernment. All right? This is Pastor Mike. I love you. I'm out of here. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.